that Precambrian rabbit. Well, actually, if you look at the picture, you'll notice that it's a Cambrian rabbit. But, you know, you have to make do with the pictures you can find. Why a Precambrian rabbit? Well, in the philosophy of science, there was a point where people thought science could prove things. Turns out, you can't. Um, and in the wake of that discovery, uh, what was left was the positivists and they just simply didn't understand science and everybody eventually knew it, uh, including the positivists themselves, the very people who believe in positivistic philosophy. Karl Popper came along and said, no, you know what makes a difference in science? Well, let's compare science with what he considered pseudoscience, and I think he was right about that. He was reacting to the idea that science could be proven true, and he discussed the distinction between Einstein in physics and the new theory of relativity that was coming out, and the Freudians are Marxists. And the difference is, at least in his telling, and I think he had a very good point, that it didn't matter what happened to Freudian, you just fit it into the interpretive scheme. There was no way of falsifying the scheme itself. It didn't matter to Marxist what historically happened. He just fit it into the theory. And the theory could accommodate virtually anything. And yet Einstein said, you know, if things don't happen in a very specific way in physics, my theory is wrong. And we'll have to go back to the drawing boards and figure out what's really going on. And that willingness to put one's theory up to nature and let nature actually judge was something that he f believed that uh, was central to science. Now, I think he's partly right. It turns out that falsification is not as easy as one might think. Um, and it also turns out that scientists don't try to find theories that are falsifiable. They try to find theories that could be falsifiable, but in fact are not falsified. And um, the difference is the scientists are actually looking at something slightly different from falsification. They're looking at predictive ability. Now the flip side of the coin of predictability is falsification. So in that sense, falsification is close to central to scientific theory, but it's really predictive ability that scientists want. So what you really, if you, do, if you have a, a theory that can't be falsified, it also can't make predictions, which means that it's useless. But a lot of people hung on to Karl Popper as, as having the truth about science. And so you'll hear a lot about, well, is this theory testable, which is another way of saying, is it falsifiable? And um, I think I have a slide out of order. Um, the Precambrian rabbit came out of a comment by G.B.S. Haldane, at least a reported comment by G.B.S. Haldane, who said, well, what can falsify the theory of evolution? And his comment is a rabbit in the Precambrian. Um, because there are no precursors, there's no successors, there's no connection with evolution whatsoever, and so if you found that, evolution would just have to quit. Well, as we will see, it's not quite that easy. Um, this is a, a conversation that was had in, uh, uh, in Uncommon Descent, and that's the uh, web address for it. And, um, and you'll find um, Ellen Fox saying the final comment that he has is, find a Cambrian rabbit and the theory of evolution is in trouble. Mm. 
Well, the next person down says, find a Cambrian rabbit in the theory of evolution is in trouble with a stupid comment. Um, rather understandably, that didn't get much comment back. Um, but I came in about that point and said, I'm trying to understand this statement. First, are you saying that the lack of ancestors would be a problem? Or the going from complex to simple would be a problem? Or something else? What precisely is the problem that a Cambrian rabbit poses to the theory of evolution? Second, I've heard the Cambrian rabbit quoted widely. Would a Pennsylvanian rabbit do as well? About a Jurassic rabbit? About Triassic shorebirds? And there's a link to uh, where they're discussed. Would Precambrian plants qualify? Can you expand on your Precambrian rabbit a little? And then finally, if someone came, claimed to find a Cambrian rabbit, would you immediately give up on the theory of evolution? Or would you spend a great deal of time trying to prove that A, it was not a rabbit, or B, it was not Precambrian, or C, the theory of evolution can handle it very nicely after all. Thank you very much. In other words, is your, is your theory truly falsifiable, or did you just throw something out that you think and hope you'll never have to see to keep critics of the theory of evolution off your back? Hopefully, it gives somebody a little to think about and try to understand. Alan Fox comes back a little later. In other words, is your theory truly falsifiable? Well, he said yes. If fossils were genuinely, note that uh, obviously he's going to try A, B, and C. Well, he's going to try A and B at least. Found that did not fit with the nested hierarchy that is posited, the theory of evolution would at the very least require modifying. Well, maybe it wouldn't falsify the theory. Just require modification. And then uh, somebody named Dave Whisker popped in and said, I'm not Alan Fox, but I'll try to give you an answer. And um, after quoting the first paragraph of mine, he said, first of all, the original quip by Haldane referred to a Precambrian rabbit. It's not actually Cambrian. What makes a Precambrian rabbit so problematical is it predates not only a, the accepted time period, I'm sure that's a misprint, for the emergence of mammals. It also predates vertebrates and even the origin of the basic phylum for vertebrates, the chordata. Since evolutionary theory predicts a ne nested hierarchy, they start at the bottom and work out, such a discovery would push the origin of vertebrates far earlier than the Precambrian. We currently have no evidence for that in the fossil record. Since one of the important lines of evidence for evolution is the fact that the fossil record generally reflects a nested hierarchy, the only way the theory could be reconciled with the data would be to conclude that almost the entire fossil record as we know it is completely unreliable, which sounds like he's not going to go there. The chances of that are pretty slim, so the theory itself would probably have to be so drastically revised as to become unrecognizable. In my opinion, a theory requiring that kind of revision should be abandoned as untenable. So Dave is willing to take the plunge. Second, I've heard that the Cambrian rabbit quoted widely, uh, would a Pennsylvanian rabbit and so forth, uh, quoting my second paragraph. From my previous discussion, it should be obvious that the, rab that the later the rabbit is found, the less problems with the record, fossil record reflecting an overall nested hierarchy there are. For example, finding a Jurassic rabbit would post postdate the emergence of chordates and vertebrates, which throws only a smaller part of the fossil record in doubt and could well be an issue not with the theory of evolution in general, but with the, the history of a particular group. And uh, then quoting the, fi the final paragraph, um, Paul, if the theory is valid and the lines of evidence we currently use to support it are reliable, we should never see a Precambrian rabbit. So a little faith statement there. So it is valid criterion for falsification. There can be, indeed should be, many others. The reason the Precambrian rabbit is used as off, so often is because it is such a good example to counter the silly assertion that the theory of evolution is unfalsifiable in principle. Haldane's quip makes short work of that. Uh, 
Is that something you just throw out to think in the hope that you'll never see to keep the critics of theory of evolution off your back? Maybe so. And somebody else commented, and um, I'll just give it to you as complete. Um, and notice that uh, he objects to the idea of just modifying the theory. He says, if you're going to falsify it, you basically you have to start from scratch. But to, to give Dave Whisker credit, he did see, say that you can go so far back that you have to start from scratch pretty much. And then my comment uh, later on was, um, the theory of evolution is supposed to be falsifiable according to both of you. What do you do with plants in the Precambrian? And gave him a reference. And Dave Whisker comes back and says, the theory of evolution, let's see. Well, first of all, I check to see what the current thinking of the age of the salt range rocks are. I think you'll find the consensus is they are late Cambrian, not pre-Cambrian. Although Cambrian is still pretty impressive for oak leaves and things like that. Um, then I consider the fossils themselves, as Stewart and Rothwell write. Um, thick walled uh, spores showing uh, trilate marks and other ornamentations have been reported from the Cambrian rocks of India and Russia. So apparently it's not just an Indian phenomenon. The initial interpretation suggested that these were myospores of primitive vascular plants. If proven, this would place their oldest known remains in the lower Cambrian much earlier in the geologic time than one might expect, as is often the case with finds of this kind, a healthy skepticism developed. They're not really plants. They're not um, really Cambrian. There's always a possibility of contamination, and we must remember that primitive vascular plants are not the only plants that form thick-walled myospores with trilate markings. After a detailed study of myospore types produced by bryophytes, Knox concluded, except where fossil spores are found in thick organic union with recognizable parent material, however, there can be no certainty as to their relationships. This conclusion applies equally to vascular plants. And he gives the reference. As for the contamination issue, it was found that Sani's discoveries were most likely contamination because drill cores, which do not show contamination, <coughs> in the same area only revealed plant fossils consistent with Cambrian rocks throughout India and the world. As Bose wrote in 1956, spores and other plant remains in drill cores of the Punjab saline series from the Jaharla well number one in the Salt Range, West Pakistan, resemble those recorded from rocks of undisputed Cambrian age elsewhere in Israel, in India, I'm sorry, in the world. The age of the saline series is therefore Cambrian rather than tertiary as advocated by some. Notice that there's a bifurcation. Either their spores can be explained or it's not really Cambrian. And uh, again, the reference. Alan Fox says, um, my first instincts would be to check the primary literature. The following. In 1969, they again published a paper in the spores of vascular plants obtained from nine samples of Cambrian rocks in North America, further reiterating these, the existence of the vascular plants in the Cambrian, suggests a paper exists. If it demonstrates that land plants were around in the Cambrian, I am surprised it is not a hot topic. I'm further surprised that no follow-up work has been done to attempt to repeat Gosha's work. And then he says, do you have a link to the primary sources to help allay the, uh, or allay, as he noted in the next uh, note, the growing suspicion that you have thrown me a red herring? Maybe the uh, paper doesn't exist at all. And then Dave Whisker chimes in. Well, another thing to consider is that the origin of vascular plants, not the origin of land plants, that is believed to be bryophytes, had not been solidly established when Gauche and Bose did their work. 
They didn't know when vascular plants started, so they just made mistakes. At that time, the earliest fossils had been found in the Silurian, at least in large numbers. It was also believed that the environment most conducive to va for vascular plants, well-established soil, for instance, was in the Silurian as well. But I recall reading a paper discussing evidence suggesting that the right kind of soil may have existed be long before that, possibly even in the Cambrian. So the appearance of vascular plants in the Cambrian is not necessarily problematic. That's defense number C, right? However, having shown them, uh, having them showing up in the Precambrian, where there is no evidence at all for the right kind of environment and no fossils of bryophytes, would be problematic. As of today, the consensus is still for a Silurian appearance of vascular plants. Does that help? Well, it's interesting how it's being argued. Um, so I came back. Dave Whisker, thanks for your answer. My purpose here is not so much to introduce new data, although I will do so, but to point out the difficulty with falsifying evolution. You mentioned following Caldane, a Cambrian rabbit, or actually, if I understand correctly, a pre-Cambrian rabbit. You quoted me as asking if the falsification would be that easy. And I quote uh, the quote that he quoted me. To be fair, this was addressed to Alan Fox, not to you. Your response was, Paul, if the theory is valid, and the lines of evidence we currently use to support are reliable, we should never see a Precambrian rabbit, and so forth. This outlines clearly your answer to my first paragraph, but does not address the paragraph you quoted. My point is that in practice, evolutionary theory is not susceptible to such falsifications because what actually happens is that the data is challenged, and what cannot be challenged is forced into the evolutionary scenario, which then adopts the data adapts to the data. Your latest post demonstrates this process well. Your first paragraph argues that the salt range is late Cambrian, not Precambrian. That's my point B. It's not really Precambrian. You then quote someone else, Stuart and Rothwell, arguing that the spores are not really the plants they appear to be. That's, it's not really a rabbit. And that they are really contaminants. That's the variation of plant B. It's not really in the Precambrian. It dug down somehow. Earlier, you discounted the problem of a Jurassic rabbit as evolutionary theory could presumably swallow that one easily, my point C. Presumably, that is why you did not respond to the data on Triassic shorebirds. Well, the birds just evolved a little earlier than we thought they did. We now have Cambrian chordates and even vertebrates, and it is unlikely we would ever find a Cambrian rabbit for an entirely different reason. Namely, that the Cambrian is largely marine and early on mostly bottom dwellers, and rabbits are simply not found at the sea bottom. They have some problems with respirations there, I think. So Haldane, Haldane proposed a very safe bet as his test of falsifiability. You grant the salt range is Cambrian. You argue that the spores are not good enough. This understates the controversy. There were those who argued that the salt range was tertiary because of plant fragments, not just spores. For example, and here I quote uh, Anderson, 1927, uh, this specimen clearly contains fragments of several specimens of dicotyledonous leaves. This place is their age is not older than Lower Cretaceous, where the first dicots appeared. One of the leaves is very probably oak, Quercus, and its size and margin strongly suggest the Oligocene species Quercus clariensis from Western America. Think about that. It is of interest to note that I found a closely related species in the Oligocene deposits of Manchuria. This specimen is almost certainly of tertiary age. No, it's not Cambrian. It can't be Cambrian. There are oaks there. It might be helpful to read some of the details. I mean, I gave a reference. By the way, not, as far as I can tell, a creationist or even intelligent design site. In fact, I will quote the abstract. The age of the salt range formation in the salt range mountains of Pakistan was a matter of extreme controversy among geologists from the middle 19th century to the middle 20th century. 
great importance in the later discussions were fragments of advanced plants and insects discovered in the salt range formation by researchers such as Bisani. According to Sani, these finds indicated an Eocene age for the salt range formation. But the geological evidence cited by others was opposed to this conclusion, supporting instead a Cambrian age for the salt range mountain formation. Modern geological opinion is unanimous that the salt range formation is Cambrian. But Sani's evidence for advanced plant and insect remains in the salt range formation is not easily dismissed. It would appear that there is still a contradiction between the geologic and paleontological evidence, just as there was during the time of active controversy. During the time of active controversy, ERG suggested that the conflict might be resolved by posting the evidence of advanced flora and fauna in the Cambrian. So it's not really a problem for evolution that way. That's tactic e C. The idea was similarly dismissed at the time, but although it challenges accepted ideas about the evolution of life on Earth, it appears to provide the best fit with the different lines of evidence. The existence of advanced plant and animal life during the Cambrian is consistent with the accounts found in the Puranic literature of India. This would be, appear to be roughly equivalent to a Cambrian rabbit. There's further evidence of what looks like the Precambrian rabbit tracks in the plant world. And uh, there's the currents of pollen and spores in the Roema formation of Venezuela and British Guiana. Notice it got into nature in 1966. John Pittman alerted me to this particular find. My point is not so much that I've proven that the theory of evolution is wrong as that it is for practical purposes impossible to prove it wrong. Data can be disputed and the theory is flexible enough to swallow most data anyway. And if all else fails, we can put the data on a shelf and work with it later. The myth that evolution is a falsifi falsifiable theory should be laid to rest. The Cambrian rabbit or even pre-Cambrian rabbit is not an adequate retort. And then Dave Whisker answers, Sonny's results were, as I pointed out by the reference to Bose, best explained as contamination. Since numerous core drillings in the same area, which would not be subject to contamination, not only failed to find any modern plant remains, but only found plant remains consistent with Cambrian deposits throughout the world. That is why the geological consensus lies with the Cambrian age for those rocks. Had they found tertiary plant remains, then I agree the results would have been comparable to a Precambrian rabbit. They found, if they found, they found it. What they did was they said it has to be contamination. But, but that sentence, that sentence is almost <laughs> Sure. Pardon me, C could I just read this sentence again because I'm having trouble with it. Sure. Ah, uh, let me see. Um, since numerous core drillings in the same area not only failed to find any modern plant remains, but only found plant remains consistent with Cambrian deposits throughout the world. Isn't, isn't it troubling enough to have plant remains in the Cambrian? Isn't that sufficiently Difficult? I mean, does it have to be modern plant? What? Uh, am I missing something here? You know something? It might be algae. You need to watch carefully. <laughs> uh, comment back there. There, there are, there are plant remains in the Precambrian. Well, there are, according to one thing, there are plant spores in the Precambrian. And there's a big argument where some people say, well, it has to be contamination. And other people are saying, well, no, it's really there. And as far as I can tell, well, as we will see later, he says there's still a controversy going on, which means that neither side has uh, been able to convince the other. Um, I think because the evidence is pretty good, but the theory is pretty strongly against it. Um, 
And then he quotes this, you know, the, the Precambrian one that I mentioned in British Guiana and Venezuela. And he said, I'm familiar with that paper and the subsequent controversy, which as far as I know, hasn't been completely resolved. <laughs> hmm. And then he quotes my uh, point that it's, you know, how do you prove that theory wrong? A good theory should be difficult to prove wrong from a practical point of view. That's because a good theory is built from a large base of well-supported data. We don't expect a Precambrian rabbit for very solid reasons. And this is, I think, a good insight into standard evolutionary thinking. The data indicate the origin of mammals in much later strata. Not only that, all the geological and paleoecological data indicate the Precambrian environment could not support mammals, ne never mind vascular plants. Well, certainly the, the Cambrian, that's probably true because it's mostly bottom dwelling uh, creatures. Um, to accept the idea of such a rabbit requires abandoning numerous rich lines of converging multi mutually supporting evidence from different disciplines. The vast weight of evidence, I guess. So in practical terms, rare announcements, and they are very, very, very rare, proclaiming the discovery of angiosperm pollen in Precambrian rocks should be treated with considerable skepticism. I just won't believe it. Especially when more prosaic explanations, such as contamination, are known to be problems. Uh, uh, yes, Ariel. Uh, we need to consider here that these folks are not analyzing the alternate model. The creation model would not propose Precambrian, Cambrian rabbits at all. Uh, you have a, you're imagining something that uh, is totally irrelevant to the argument. Now what would be very interesting to find and could theoretically be found would be a fossil whale that had died uh, six months before and that got buried along with all the trilobites and stuff. Depending on how fast trilobites tear up whales, I don't know. You need carbon-14 dating to tell you it died just a few months ago. Well, uh, carbon-14 dating is a whole different subject that... Uh, <laughs> Even that wouldn't prove anything because they would just say that it, it was the result of some kind of uh, terrain upheaval where there is some intrusion or some insertion of material where it doesn't really belong. <coughs> um, it isn't a rabbit, or it isn't really the Precambrian, or somehow the rabbit burrowed down into the Precambrian from other areas, or the theory of evolution really can accommodate Precambrian rabbits. Those are your choices if you've got to stick with the theory of evolution. They just are. And you can see them all being employed here. Um, in principle, if Precambrian rabbits were found, especially in significant numbers, now we're going to qualify it, well, you need more than one. Uh, modern evolutionary theory and several other disciplines as well would probably have to be discarded. The fact that this is difficult to do in practical terms doesn't change that, nor should it. Okay. And so then I comment, I'm still blown away by the ease with which a leaf from an oak strongly resembling Oligocene Quercus clarensis can be dismissed as contamination. Are there claims that such oaks live in India or Pakistan at the present? If not, how can one contaminate rock with this kind of fossil? I mean, you've got to get the leaf from somewhere, right? If a drill finds a leaf, such a leaf, would you at that point surrender to the Cambrian rabbit or would you so soldier on knowing that there must be an answer consistent with evolutionary theory, even if you don't know what it is and can't hazard a guess as to what it might be? Your dismissal of the Precambrian stuff about which the controversy, as far as I, which as far as I know hasn't been completely resolved, suggests that you have a pretty large shelf to put 
uh, on, to, on which to put things that do not fit. It is probably fair to note that ideological preference plays a large part in the evaluation of evidence in these cases. As you note, in principle, Precambrian rabbits would disprove evolutionary theory. In practice, it doesn't happen. <coughs> So then we have a couple of other things, uh, people that are commenting, and I'm just going to skip through them because of the time constraints and his uh, answer to them. Dave Whisker, I'm a uh, high Paul, and he quotes um, me and says, contamination does not always mean from extant material. Intrusions from younger layers can insert themselves into areas where older layers have been pushed up. How can you contaminate from material that is not extant? Can somebody explain that one to me? Uh, if, if the material isn't there, it can't contaminate something else, can it? Yeah, but they're saying that the contamination occurred at some earlier time. But, but it had to be extant from, uh, from that earlier time, though. Uh, I mean, yeah. Well, but it, it had to be extant in the Oligocene then in order to get contaminate it if it contaminated in during the Oligocene, right? Not necessarily. How, how, didn't there have to be oaks growing there sometime in order to get oak leaves fossilized into? Uh, you're playing with the word extant because you could have Pliocene contamination of Oligocene material that's old and fossilized and still getting to Cambria. So, you know, geology is very complex. I, I, well, but, but if it's not extant during some period of time. Yeah, you're playing with words. Um, if, if <laughs> you, you have to have the material there somewhere. And, and to say, okay, it's not there now, uh, but maybe it was there in the past, Okay, which past epoch was it there in? And why should we not find, um, uh, let's say, oak leaves uh, in the Oligocene or Pleistocene or where, whatever this particular oak was supposed to have been living? It, it has to be there somewhere in order to get into it. Uh, unless we're transporting stuff from Manchuria or the United States. Uh, intrusions from younger layers can insert themselves into areas where older layers have been pushed, especially in geologically active areas. And he talks about the salt range is in a complex area where the Indian plate crashes into the Eurasian plate. In addition, the salt deposits uh, move like glaciers, which is called salt tectonics, so the salt creep. Um, and then he says, does Pittman source mention the paper by Boire? Ardwash in Nature who examined sandstone given by Sani to look for evidence of land plants and his results in all more than 50 permanent pr preparations and a number of smear sites were presented but no mm -hmm. microfossils were recovered. The results are negative and do not show any evidence of a post-Cambrian -Cam age for these rocks. Um, but if you find fossils in one particular area and you don't find fossils in another particular area, does the fossil area that you don't find them in cancel out the one that you do find them in. Um, it seems like positive evidence is more worthwhile than negative evidence in this kind of situation. And Bordwaj uh, goes on to say, careful research by Su on the purple sandstone by Sani Laknapal and uh, Bordwaj on beds of salt pseudomorphs have revealed a complete absence of any tertiary fossils in them, uh, except for the people who did find them. So what does Bardwaj have to say about Ghosh's finding? Ghosh's finding makes it difficult to reconcile our findings with their work. The only explanation of their find of tertiary plant remains in these rocks of a Cambrian sequence would seem to be contamination during investigation Again, you have to have oaks in the area if you're going to do that. Or the use of cracked and fissured samples. So if Ghost says he didn't use cracked or fissured samples, is that good enough? Or 
do you have to personally see the no cracks or fissures, or are you going to say there must be cracks and fissures because you can't have those samples in this? Anyway, so he gives the, um, the, the reference for that, Nature in 1950. As for the genus Quercus, uh, several species are known in Asia, but not Quercus clemensis. One report suggesting a leaf strongly resembling Quercus clemensis isn't exactly confirmation now, is it? We need more than one Precambrian rabbit. In paleobotany, misidentification of plant fossils is a, an occupational hazard. See, so you know, uh, Paleozoganga sperms is one exa excellent example. So I'll wait for confirmation before jumping to conclusions. Especially since all confirmed <coughs> fossils of uh, Quercus clemensis are found in North America, not Asia, as far as I'm aware. I guess there was one in Manchuria they mentioned. Um, do you think one uh, unconfirmed sample is enough evidence to have botany textbooks changed to declare this species have, having existed in Asia? Is that how you think science should work? I don't know. I like to have my science empirically based, but if a royal core finds such a leaf, would you at that point? Uh, how is recognizing that a controversy hasn't been resolved a dismissal? I have a pretty large shelf, yes, but it isn't full of unresolved samples, so he's not going to even admit that this is on his shelf. It's crammed with examples contradicting those very rare, rare unresolved samples you are bringing up. He does have a, a, a shelf that he puts it on. It's an unresolved sample. He just doesn't want to say that he has one because that's admitting weakness in a debate like this. I wish it wasn't a debate, but... And then um, I'm going to skip over Jerry and his response again for the same reason. Um, and then and I finish up with saying, uh, Dave Whisker, what you're doing is a great way of arguing that the evidence I cited does not disprove evolution. What it is not is a convincing way of arguing that evolution is susceptible to this proof. I discussed the problem of contamination of macroscopic fossils of plants that, as far as I, and presumably you, know, do not live in the area now, and you propose that those plants lived there previously and got buried and placed in the Cambrian se uh, sediment because that er the area is geologically active. You go on to later say that since all confirmed fo uh, fossils of Acute clemensis are found in North America, not Asia, as far as I'm aware. Thus, there's no evidence that, uh, that there were these particular oaks in the Oligocene, or apparently at any other time, that lived in the area, but you still write it off to contamination. Mm -hmm. You then minimize the problem thus. Bardwell was unable to find microfossils similar to those apparently found by Sani, who argued for a Cenozoic age, if I recall correctly. So the fossil, partial oak leaf, is unconfirmed. And then you ask, do you think one unconfirmed sample is enough evidence to have botany textbooks changed to declare this species have existed, having existed in Asia? Is that how you think science should work? To put it another way, we found the, the paw of a rabbit in the Cambrian. We now need to find more rabbit parts because one rabbit in the Cambrian isn't really enough. You minimize the Precambrian angiosperm example from Venezuela is those very rare unresolved samples you are bringing up. Precisely how many Precambrian rabbits do we need to find to disprove evolution? You state that a good theory should be difficult to prove wrong from a practical point of view. That's because a good theory is built from a large base of well-supported data. In, in physics, this is not true. The reason a good theory is difficult to prove wrong in physics is that nature behaves in ways that the theory describes. If one could accelerate electrons reproducibly to the speed of light in a vacuum and beyond, relativity would collapse, period. If someone were to show that a body were to accelerate towards another one at a rate disproportional to the inverse square of the distance between them, gravitation would collapse as a theory. In fact, it did so when the motion of Mercury did not fit the theory. 
Gravitation may be a useful approximation, but nobody believes it anymore as a complete explanation. Perhaps evolution isn't a useful explanation, but does not explain everything. Can one not be a little more tentative about the complete adequacy of the theory? And that was the end of that discussion. <coughs> now you will notice in passing that we talked about Triassic shorebirds. And there's a very interesting story to this that I thought you would like to know. The first article that I will bring to your attention was in Nature in 2002, and it was entitled Bird-like Fossil Footprints from the Lake Triassic. And I want you to note the people who are uh, writing it, Melchor um, de Valais, I think that's de Valais, I assume that that's French, and Jorge Genise. And uh, the study of fossilized footprints and tracks of dinosaurs and other vertebrates have provided insight into the origin, evolution, and extinction of several major groups and their behavior. It has also been an important complement to their body fossil record. The known history of birds starts in the late Jurassic epoch, about 150 million years ago, with the record of Archaeopteryx. I think there's actually a few more that are a little bit before that now. Whereas the Coleosaurian ancestors of the birds date back to the early Jurassic. The hind limbs of late Triassic epoch theropods lacked osteological evidence for an avian reversed hallux. That's the thumb that's deliberately put on the opposite end. Um, and also display other functional differences from birds. Previous references to suggested late Triassic to early Jurassic bird-like footprints have been reinterpreted as produced by non-avian dinosaurs having a high angle between digits two and four. And in all cases, their avian affinities have been challenged. Here we describe well-preserved and abundant footprints with clearly avian characteristics from a late Triassic red bed sequence of Argentina, at least 55 million years before the first known skeletal record of birds. These footprints document the activities in an environment inter interpreted as small ponds associated with ephemeral rivers of an unknown group of late Triassic theropods having some avian characters. These are bird-like tracks. And then it goes on, and if you're wondering how they know, it was Triassic, it's very easy. They did radiometric dating. Concurrently, an interbedded basalt flow located about 80 meters above the track-bearing horizons. So this is older, the, the track horizons are older than the flow. Um, yielded a argon-argon, 40 argon to 39 argon plateau age of 212.5 plus or minus 7 million years ago. And this is done by step heating analysis on the albite crystal. And I will tell you that uh, that is probably as good as potassium argon dating gets. It's done by uh, uh, measuring, uh, turning some of the potassium into argon. That's the argon um, 39. And measuring the ratio of argon to argon, so, and then using complex formula that's, that has as its heart the potassium argon uh, formula. And they're measuring into the crystals and then once they get standard ages that don't move going further back into the crystal, that's a plateau age and that's, like I say, that's for our potassium argon dating, that's state of the art. Um, here's some of the bird tracks. And uh, I mean, they sure look like birds. Well, maybe they're dinosaurs that had bird-like hind limbs. Mm -hmm. Kind of small. They're, if you'll see, this is a two centimeters. That's not quite an inch. So that gives you an idea of, you know, mm -hmm. those birds are what? Inch and a half, two inches across. 
I think these are one centimeter bars here. Here's some more. This is um, actually a cast of it, whereas these are molds. This is the actual tracks themselves. And, you know, they look like birds. And so they kept studying ichnotaxonomy of bird-like footprints, an example from the late Triassic, early Jurassic of Northwest Argentina. Well, maybe it's not quite Triassic, it's like early Jurassic. So we're kind of nudging it down a little bit from the Triassic we'd heard before. Um, and I want to quote just a part of this article. Um, the article is available if you go to the university. They, uh, they can pull out a copy of it for you if you're interested. The bird-like footprints in this study were recovered from the upper part of the Santo Domingo Formation, northwest uh, La Rioja province. I guess they pronounce it La Rioja. La Rioja. Rioja. At least parts of Argentina, they do that J as a as kind of ZH, if I remember correctly. But, but it's not exactly ZH, it's similar. Yeah. And um, in any way, in particular, the studied material was collected at a Cadabra de Santo Domingo, and they give you precise coordinates. Mm -hmm. And uh, um, continuing on, they will tell you that the Santo Domingo formation is interpreted as late Triassic, early Jurassic, as suggested by the presence of the middle to late Triassic Guanwana wood morphogenesis Rex oxylon. So they not only have this dated by the um, previously mentioned Argon 40, Argon 39, but they also have it dated by this wood that actually is middle to late Triassic, suggesting Jurassic is pushing it a little bit. And they have a date by paleomagnetic data. Well, what more could you ask, right? Well, as we shall find out, you need more. There's another article in paleogeography, paleoclimatography, and paleoecology that um, uh, talks more about these tracts. And uh, there's a very, very long abstract, which I won't bother to read to you. Um, and you can see they have been, they've looked at all kinds of uh, uh, tracks of various kinds and, and also whatever they can find there. And um, additional Ichthonological studies are necessary to assess the exact meaning of different trace fossil <laughs> features in terms of sub substrate consistency. Uh, if I translate that into ordinary English, basically what they're saying is we need to study what modern birds do in order to interpret what these things are doing. <laughs> well, they did that and um, is they applied neoecological studies looking at where sandpipers had been around the lake, modern sandpipers. And uh, they found some very interesting things. Well, this, by the way, is where in Argentina it's found. It's right next to Chile. And you can see the little square there. And this is stuff that they've... The, there are quite a few things that have to do with the geology. This particular is one of the most interesting. Um, and you see this long thing sticking down from behind that? And this long thing sticking down? Apparently, that is where the bird is landing and drags its trailing thumb. <coughs> It's actually got you know four fingers, uh, three fingers and a thumb, and so when it lands, it kind of like an air airplane, 
kind of coming in with, a, you know, and the, the wheels hit the ground and then. And so what you're looking at is these critters flew. Well, that pretty much means they are birds. They're not late dinosaurs or anything like that because none of the dinosaurs that they know of could fly. So now in this, uh, they have a very interesting comment here. The recognition of traces of flight, Volichnia, probing marks and tracks showing morphology similar to modern shorebirds strongly suggest an avian affinity for the producers of the fossil tracks, and in consequence, the Santo Domingo track site would be younger than supposed. But what do you do with the radiometric date and the um, fossils <coughs> that they find that are only Triassic? Well, it doesn't matter. They finally, in 2013, uh, made a retraction to the original article. In this letter, we considered bird-like footprints from the former Santo Domingo formation of northwest Argentina to be of late Triassic age. Recent radiometric dating, so they went back and redated it, and we'll look at what I can of that. Unfortunately, I was going to bring you a, a nice photograph of their, uh, of their data as well, but that managed to escape my computer, but I do have the article and you can look it up. Um, of the sedimentary sequence containing these bird-like footprints, renamed as Laguna Brava Formation, so they're going to give it a whole new name, indicated a late Eocene age. Further geologic studies suggest that the region suffered a complex deformation during the Andean orogeny when the Andes Mountains were formed, including block rotation. In consequence, block rotation. I guess maybe they figure that that'll answer the question of, uh, of magnetic reversal. In consequence, our previous inferences about the possible implications of this finding for the fossil record of Aves are no longer supported. This retraction has not been signed by JFG, I said, Jorge uh, Genese, I assume. So apparently one of the three wasn't willing to put his name to that. Correspondence should be addressed to Ricardo Melchor. And there's the reference, and we'll go and look at that. Uh, unfortunately, like I said, I don't have it actually with me, but I do have the, that's the reference. Um, and here's the, here's the abstract. Um, Notice that Melchor is one of the people here, and he got a couple of other people to work with him on this. Bird-like tracks from northwest Argentina have been reported as being a late Triassic age. They were attributed to an unknown group of theropods showing some avian characters. However, we believe that these tracks are late Eocene age on the basis of a new weighted mean 206 lead to 238 uranium date, isotope dilution, thermal ionization mass spectrometry method on zircons from a tough bed in the sedimentary su succession containing the fossil tracks. Now, why that trumps albite, I don't know, but apparently it does. In consequence, the mentioned tracks are assigned to birds, and its occurrence matches the known fossil record of Aves. So now, it's Eocene, so there's no problem. Now, my own take. All of this is logical, except that the original dating methods are not now shown to be unreliable. Whatever that wood was, you can't trust it. And certainly, you can't trust potassium argon dating, even in its latest um, uh, version. The only thing that matters is that the narrative is not falsified. Precambrian rabbits would not falsify Darwinism. We'd find some way to explain it all. And some others agree. This is a report, and just to give you a little background, um, Stephen Meyer and uh, Jonathan um, Wells went to the University of uh, uh, Oklahoma at Norman and um, 
In an attempt to counter the impact of Darwin's dilemma, Mary's announced that the museum, that is the Sam Noble Museum of Natural History, would open its uh, evolution exhibition to the public free of charge until 11 p.m. on September 29. Um, in addition, the museum would sponsor a free public lecture at 5 p.m. that day by Dr. Stephen Westrop, its curator of invertebrate pathology, titled The Cambrian Explosion and the Burgess Shale, No Dilemma for Darwin. This is to counter a movie called Darwin's Dilemma. Okay, and then a little reporting on what happened. To be fair, this is by Jonathan Wells, so it's a little biased, but I think he was trying to be as accurate as he could. Westrup concluded by taking exception to J.B.S. Haldane's claim that finding a fossil rabbit in the Precambrian would prove Darwin's theory wrong. If such a fossil were found, Westrup said, paleontologists would simply revise their reconstruction of the history of life. <coughs> During the question and answer, one student asked him whether any fossil find could falsify Darwin's theory, and Professor Westrup said no. Since Darwin's theory is really about natural selection, which operates on a much shorter time scale than the fossil record. Another student asked him whether he had seen the movie Darwin's Dilemma. He said he hadn't, but his lecture was not intended to be a response to the movie. The lecture is entitled No Dilemma for Darwin, but it wasn't intended to be a response to the movie. Okay, this is not science versus religion. This is a clash of two philosophies. In some important areas, our side has more data supporting it. Radiometric dating appears to have, if I can, or I guess it's a wax nose, they say. Um, but that's my opinion. Now it's time for you guys to comment. <coughs> Go ahead while we find, oh, we have one back here. I, I would uh, comment here that if we should find a uh, Cambrian or pre-Cambrian rabbit, uh, this would also tend to disprove uh, creation. Uh, in other words, I'm coming back to the point, this issue does not address the question. Uh, it's uh, it's just you know uh, throwing in kind of an odd type of thing that doesn't fit the general models of either creation or evolution. Uh, I can remember a, a person discussing or discussing ecological zonation theory, and uh, it's very remarkable that the fossil record, as you go on up, uh, you have no except for a few exceptions. You have no plants, terrestrial plants, till you get up to the Silurian. You have no terrestrial animals till you get to that. Your Cambrian is marine. Your Ordovician is marine. Your lower part of the Silurian is marine. Uh, and this fits so nicely with the idea, well, this represents the pre-flood seas, the, that when the fountains of the deep broke up, and the Bible describes so on, the, this is the lowest part, and uh, the Cambrian explosion that occurs at, right at the bottom of this, which is where you have all your major animal phyla, uh, not all of them, but a major group of them, uh, appearing you know, fairly suddenly and so on. Uh, this is just what you'd expect from the flood model. Uh, now, I'm not saying there aren't other problems, you know, but with the fossil record, but I'm saying that some of this data here fits very well what you'd expect of the flood. The fact that you don't have terrestrialization before you have, before the Silurian, uh, is, fits better with the flood model than it does with the um, uh, evolutionary model, per se. And, uh, so, so there's data there, you know, that uh, I think strongly favors uh, the biblical model, and that uh, you know, if you want to uh, 
say, well, you should find ra rabbits in the Cambrian. That's not where the pre-flood seas were. It's all marine material then. It, uh, you don't, like my one student said, uh, well, uh, you know, uh, why don't we find mammals in the Cambrian? I told him, there are no cows in the ocean now at present. Well, there are that, no rabbits in the ocean at present. That's what I noted. You may have remembered that uh, there's a little problem with respiration when rabbits are in the deep ocean. Exactly. <laughs> that's, uh, it doesn't fit the mo either model, but anyway, uh, it's interesting. Leonard wants to. Uh, Leonard. <coughs> I have a couple of papers from the geological literature that, that have drawings of fossils that look exactly like birds. Uh, even if you try to make those into dinosaurs, that's problematic being in the, in the uh, Carboniferous, in the Paleozoic. But one of these papers just calls it an unidentified track. The other one says, this track would certainly have been called a bird except that it's in the Paleozoic. So, you know, can prove things, like you say, but anyway, its evidence needs to be considered. A comment uh, there and then back here. Uh, I think we need to distinguish here between empirical questions that are answered by appealing to things like uh, botany and zoology and astronomy and uh, physics and philosophical or logical or epistemological questions which have to do with what is truth and what are the criteria that determine truth. These are quite distinct questions. And uh, uh, Popper's uh, test here of falsifiability uh, applies in the strictest sense only, logically speaking, to tautologies. If you take something like A is A, that's not falsifiable the law of identity, they used to call it in logic, or A is not non-A, the law of contradiction, or A is either B or non-B, the law of excluded middle. Those aren't falsifiable. But anything that's empirical is always conceivably falsifiable. We now may not be able to think of what would falsify it, and generally speaking, any interpretation of empirical data can be modified to accommodate new anomalous data that come up that don't fit in. A good example is Thomas Kuhn's book, which has probably been as influential as Popper's, The Structure of Scientific Revolutions, in which he points out that the whole history of science in almost any field is starting with limited data and making an interpretation that fits those data, and then as the science advances, finding data that don't fit that interpretation so you modify it to include them, and then finding more data that don't fit that revision, and eventually you get to a point where the tension is so great that it breaks the interpretive framework and you have to get a brand new one. That's what happened, for instance, with the uh, uh, question of uh, the solar system. You started out with uh, Aristotle and Ptolemy explaining a geocentric theory. And uh, as they got more and more data, especially the planets that were wanderers that didn't fit the idea of all the bodies going around the Earth, uh, they, Ptolemy came along with his theory of cycles and epicycles and so on. And eventually, if he added enough cycles and epicycles going clockwise and counterclockwise at different uh, speeds, he could explain any pattern of motion the planets appeared to make among the fixed stars after it occurred, but he couldn't predict anything. And then Kepler came along with his laws, which did predict the motions of the planets, and almost everybody believed then the, he, the geocentric, I mean the heliocentric theory rather than the geocentric theory. But you still didn't have absolute proof. It wasn't until the 19th century when telescopes were fine enough to measure the annular parallax of the stars. You shoot a star six months apart when the Earth is on one side of the sun and then on the opposite side of the sun, you get a triangle 
and you can measure. It's a very thin triangle with very acute angles, but it does prove that the Earth goes around the sun. That was the first real proof up until that time. You could just keep adding cycles and epicycles to explain whatever data you found. So coming back to Popper here, any proposition that's meaningful empirically can conceivably always be falsified. There are no unfalsifiable propositions. The only ones that are unfalsifiable are totologies. And Haldane hit it on the head when he said the universe is not only stranger than we think, it's stranger than we can think. There may be things out there that we haven't thought of yet that would falsify any proposition you can come up with. Yes. Um, on that retraction paper, uh, the guy doing it is Melkor. He's the lead author. <coughs> That's correct. Um, it appears, and the guy not signing it is that J.F. Janice, who is like the third author. So yes. I'm wondering, is, is the lead author like the professor, and Janice is like the graduate student who did the actual field work? Or maybe it was the other way around, and the graduate student has more pressure on him, and the other guy is saying, no, but I know what I saw. Well, I, I was, okay. All right. I I don't know, and I'd, and I'd have to I'd have to go back and ask. It'd be interesting to look a little more into the uh, into the background on that. Ariel, I think this George Genese is uh, one who has uh, also looked at termite nests in my work, and uh, he's quoted me a couple of times in the literature. Uh, he does not disagree, he doesn't agree with my injection of termites, but he agrees that Hasiotis is totally wrong in saying these are termite nests. And uh, uh, it's very interesting to me what, when he withdrew from that uh, alternate interpretation, this is very interesting. You, you think something is going on inside of his head, maybe, well, as to... I, I credit him with being a, an independent thinker. Uh, fascinating. Yes. Um. I'm trying to understand the relationship between dating techniques and the location where the evidence is found, the strata. Uh, are those independent or dependent? I. <laughs> That's a very good question, and uh, it, it's probably best addressed to the people who did the dating methods and uh, those who uh, reported them. Uh, it would be fascinating to know whether in either case or in both cases, somebody said, you know, I think that the data range that we should be getting is somewhere in this area. Um, because if they did say that, it does suggest that maybe radiometric dating is not quite as independent as we've been led to believe. Uh, if those are blind dates, then I'm not sure how to explain the, the one date giving Triassic and the other date giving uh, that, uh, Eocene. Yes. It's like, um, but of course we all know that uh, radiometric dating is usually agree, so. <laughs> well, that's what I've been told by people on the other side, that they're really, we don't have problems like this. In which case, just repeating the same method should produce some improved measurement. <laughs> Do you know how many zircons they had? Did they just pick a peak in the zircons like they do in some of these methods, or did, did they? Okay, I wish I had the, the article itself. I, like I say, that was one thing that I missed copying Thursday, and then by the time Friday came, the library was closed, and I couldn't get to it. Um, but um, there were at least six different uh, dates that they got with error bars, and they did a weighted mean. Some of the some of the dates that they got were off of the weighted mean, but apparently they felt that, mm, it looked like they felt the lower dates were more reliable, but. Another problem with uh, Popper's approach to 
scientific truth is that positivists generally have tended to stretch it far beyond science and to argue that uh, any proposition in whatever field that's not falsifiable is therefore meaningless. And that doesn't follow at all. What they really mean is if it can't be tested by scientific method, then it's meaningless. And uh, that is not true. Then there's an unspoken assumption, and that is that anything that can't be tested by science is not uh, and meaningful or true. And of course, that is total poppycock for the simple reason that history cannot be tested by science, yeah. and yet is true and meaningful. The, that's right. The only propositions really other than totologies that are not falsifiable are ones that are nonsensical, that don't mean anything. Yeah. For instance, if I say a round square is the uh, pi time its radius, I'm not saying anything. That's meaningless. And uh, obviously that's not falsifiable because, because I'm not asserting anything. But the truths of mathematics, most of them have been proved to be uncertain. Dr. Roth referred to Gödel's theorem of incompleteness. And Bertrand Russell and Whitehead, uh, with their theory of types, proved that a lot of mathematics is based on assumptions that can't be proved. So, um, I'm going to give it to I, you. Uh, I, uh, go ahead. Um, yeah, I'd like to step back, take an overview from the broader creationist perspective, and I'm personally a committed creationist in that I reject the idea of chance processes accounting for what we have. I also see God interacting not just one time in a theistic evolutionary way, but I see uh, God speaking, doing things that um, perhaps um, are inexplicable to science. So with that caveat, I'd like to mention that creationism has a history of trying to find the rare rabbits, not rare rabbits, the rare rabbits all through, uh, they're actually all through the geological column. You could probably multiply your examples a hundredfold, you know, there are a lot of and a lot of them are thing. discounted by the standard. Oh yeah, yeah. You find that's a, a part of science. You yeah. you got to debate it out and look at both sides and try and figure out what the answer is. But you know, Clifford Burdick was very good at coming up with the inexplicable. But unfortunately, he was wrong on a lot of things, like the human tracks with dinosaur tracks in Paluxy, Texas. He also was the one that promoted the idea of angiosperm pollen in the Precambrian. We're going down below the river level largely. Specifically in, in the Grand Canyon. Yes, Grand Canyon. He's the one that alerted everyone that there was a problem. Now there is a problem. And as you know, Loma Linda palynologists went and took some of the same samples and they couldn't replicate what he had done. I say same samples, they probably didn't know exactly what part of the rock formation it was pulled out of, but they went to the very rock formations that he had studied. Now, my training is in palynology. I'm not a practicing palynologist, so I can only speak about my early laboratory experience. Contamination is a problem. I spent a whole summer on some samples from a core, a deep Pleistocene core in New Mexico, and I was getting a little bit of pollen here and there. I take him to my professor and he said, ah, contamination. Because I didn't have enough to really, it wasn't repeatable. You know, I couldn't predict. There was no predictability and so on. So that was a hard lesson. I wasted a whole summer in contamination. Now, I think with verdicts, uh, thing is it's contamination, not modern through the laboratory window like mine was, or not somewhere between collecting in a plastic bag and getting to the lab something crept in. I think ancient contamination, if I can use that word, but not as ancient as Precambrian, not even as ancient as Cretaceous, where you expect the first 
you know, angiosperms. And here's the scenario I've developed. And that's the idea that the Grand Canyon has been blocked by uh, lava flows. And Steve Austin has it in his book called The Grand Canyon. Thirteen different times you've had major lava flows. And many times you've had ri rivers, I mean lakes form with dams several hundred feet uh, deep. Robert Brown uh, studied Rampart Cave, and you had driftwood, and it's far above the bottom of the, uh, the valley there, or the present course of the river. And the river wasn't cutting that quickly from Rampart down, and so that would show maybe a lake bed. Now, when lakes have water, they also have pollen that's washed in. And some of the most uh, susceptible rocks for pollen kind of seeping in would be the uh, shale. Because a lot of water can flow through shale through the uh, micro crevices, usually lateral and not vertical. And the idea is the shale is, is actually f uh, made, made into a filtering mechanism. Shale is very good at filtering, um, you know. So my theory is that you only find the Precambrian pollen and the Cambrian pollen only in the lower part of the Grand Canyon where it was flooded once. You go to similar shale up in the Pennsylvania and up higher, and there's no pollen contamination. So it probably is Colorado River pollen. You look at some of um, Burdick's slides, and that pollen, especially pine pollen, is really beat up. It's had a lot of, um, you know, abuse to it, and it's not just drifted in in quiet waters. It's probably the same. So that's a theory I've come up with. I submitted it to Creation Research Society Quarterly in a, a scholarly article. They rejected it. Why? Because they've had several of their scholars replicate Burdick and prove that he's right. And so because of philosophical <coughs> biases, I could say, uh, they've rejected my proposal, which may have some merit in, may not, but at least I'd like to see it out there, you know, amongst creationists, so then we can debate it. Could, so could that's that where paper be submitted that. to the standard literature? Pardon? Could that paper have been submitted to the standard literature? Well, yeah, anytime you're critical of creationists, you probably can get it published, <laughs> but you. I don't want to come across that way. I'd rather see the creationists uh, publish on that. Uh, two, two little comments. Uh, okay. I, uh, I think your uh, suggestion of contamination here is a very viable one. And as I mentioned, I think it was last week here, uh, you go down 200 meters, 600 feet, and, and uh, below the Savannah River and so on, you find live algae. Yeah. How did they get there? Uh, algae needs light for, <laughs> for growing, so obviously contamination way down in the, in the layers. I mean, we were talking, uh, and uh, you have cracks forming and so on. I would uh, make one note of caution about all these lakes uh, in the Grand Canyon. Uh, uh, a recent paper completely rejects that idea. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, <laughs> they were all, they, they don't know that this is, uh, if something uh, bothers you, just wait a while. Maybe the idea will usually change. I hope they dealt with uh, Rampart Cave because I, you have to get some driftwood in that cave somehow. I, I would like to inject one more point into the hopper here that we've had going for several weeks that hasn't been injected so far. We're talking all the time, of course, as though there is a causal order in the universe uh, which is never violated unless it's a miracle of some sort, uh, like creation, for example, intelligent design. But uh, there are very uh, strong evidences, and uh, many respectable scientists even take them seriously, that there are other kinds of order at work in the universe besides causality. Uh, sometimes it goes by the name of seriality, sometimes uh, synchronicity. Uh, uh, Carl Jung, for instance, the uh, psychiatrist, uh, made a great deal of synchronicity. 
And uh, what it really assumes is that there is a non-causal order that uh, comes close to what might be called some form of intelligent design. Even in the examples that I gave about gambling in my first comment, the lotto or card games, which we think of as being governed totally by probability theory, if intelligent design is intruded, a very remote possibility can be turned into a certainty. But we call intelligent design in that case cheating. A good mechanic who can stack a deck or deal off the bottom or substitute a stacked deck for one that's been used before can turn a royal flush into a certainty and give it to anybody he wants. And uh, by the same token, a divine creator can intervene at any point in the chain and produce something that would not be causally predictable. It's just a question of whether or not there is any evidence that this kind of non-causal principle is at work. Oh, um, yeah. We'll, uh, we'll give the last word to Leonard here. <clears throat> I don't know if it's worthy of that, but <laughs> anyway. As far as the, the verdict pollen, um, we really need to ask Art Chadwick who did that work, but I was here while he was working on it. And I, my recollection is that Burdick went down with them, showed them where he collected his samples. And Chadwick did struggle a lot with modern contamination. I don't know if all of it was that, but, but he did have to work really hard to get rid of modern contamination. Well, um, I uh, tell you what, uh, let's uh, continue for those of you who want to on a private basis to give some of the rest of you a chance to get out of here. And uh, uh, next week, uh, if you have the email, you'll know it's coming. If you don't, why, it'll be a surprise, I guess, because I'm still deciding. <laughs> With that, we'll see you.